Greetings. Welcome to Daniel chapter 2, lesson 3, The Forgotten Dream. Again, I'm Dr. Rich Turner. Uh, the focus of these lessons or the design of these lessons is really for my Sunday school class in the event they miss one of our lessons. Um, again, we will not cover a lot of the things that might come up in the class and a lot of the issues we might discuss in the class, but I, this will give you a way to at least have the planned content should you be out a particular week. By way of reminder, we are in Babylon. The year right now is still around 605 BC. Again, if Daniel went, in, <clears throat> went into captivity in 605 BC, he would have been born around 622 if he was indeed roughly 17. And again, he lived about 90 years. That mu does mean that Daniel would have been contemporary with Ezekiel, um, who went into captivity in the second wave, and then also um, contemporary with Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Again, by way of reminder, this is the Babylonian Empire at its peak. This is really the areas that it controlled and even had an influence on. You can see it very wide and sweeping range of influence. By the way, those from Jerusalem to Babylon, 500 miles as a crow flies. So as you think about um, taking captives from Jerusalem to Babylon, the trade routes, it could have been as much as 900 miles march across the desert. It would have been absolutely brutal. There's no doubt many people died. Um, this is an artist's rendition of Babylon. Again, a massive city, the largest city of its time, a very wealthy city protected by a massive wall, a moat. So here's the Euphrates River that goes through the city, but you can see they've created a moat uh, that siphons water off the Euphrates uh, that goes around the city. This is another artist's rendition of the city. Again, picture those massive dual walls. Um, Supposedly, there was a racetrack, uh, a chariot racetrack between those two walls. That's the Edmanaki, or the platform of the house between heaven and an earth. Again, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, history tells us he built the blue-bricked uh, shrine to Marduk on the top of that. But there is a chance that um, that building itself was the original, at least what was left of the original Tower of Babel. But again, as you think about Babylon, I want you to think about a very wealthy city, a very rich city, a very prosperous city, a very powerful kingdom uh, under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. This is a different artist's rendition. Again, the idea, picture those massive walls, picture the beautiful blue brick, picture gold. Would have been a very wealthy, very rich, very beautiful city, yet also a very pagan city. So let's get to our lesson, January chapter 2. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now at this point, as we go into uh, verse 4, it's important to note that the book does shift from Hebrew to Aramaic, and it'll remain in Aramaic for a number of chapters now. It won't be until chapter uh, end of chapter 7 that we get out of Aramaic. So verse 4, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not know the dream to me, or if, excuse me, if you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap or a latrine. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. Then the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. 
For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing <clears throat> that the king request, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now again, you should sense the idea that here we have a book that is absolutely rooted in history. This is the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Now scholars are not sure how the length is being recorded, whether it's the traditional Hebrew method or whether it's the Chaldean method, but here's the point. Um, this book is rooted in history and whether this is the very next year and Daniel is still in the three-year training plan or whether he's just exiting that plan, the point is, as we read Daniel, we're not only reading a book where we see the activity of God in the affairs of man, but we're reading a book that's anchored in historical reality. So whether this happened right after Daniel got out of the three-year training plan or whether this is year two, either way, all of these things still stand. So the king calls in in verse two and he gives the command to the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. So four different um Aramaic words there. The key point is these are the wise men. These are the men he trusts. These are the inner circle. These are the ones who can interpret dreams. And he brings them in. No doubt he's used them before. And he now tells them in verse three, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Have you ever had a dream and you kind of remembered it? And the longer you were awake, it just sort of faded away. Well, that appears to be what's happened to Nebuchadnezzar. The dream had alarmed him. The dream had startled him. The dream has escaped him. And he's telling these magicians and astrologers and sorcerers and Chaldeans that I'm anxious to know the dream and its interpretation. Now, to be honest, it's not really a dream that the king has had. It is a nightmare. And that is why his spirit is anxious within him. He is in a mild panic about this dream. What's interesting is we watch these events just sort of unfold before us. We see two important things about lost people, two important things about men who don't know God, two reminders about their character. One is insecurity or even fear, and the other is hostility, anger, rage, whatever word you want. And you see this in lost people all the time. When the heat goes up, fear and insecurity and anger are the two things, or at least one of those things that always bubble over. That's exactly what we're going to see in Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to see a man whose insecurity and his rage just bubble over. Verse four, and again, this is where the book shifts to from Hebrew to Aramaic. It will remain in Aramaic until 728. And so the Chaldeans tell the king in verse four, tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. That seems very reasonable. The king again in verses five and six, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be turned to an ash heap. That's very kind. Your houses are going to be turned into a dung heap. They're going to be turned into a latrine. Again, you see already the insecurity, the fear, the rage. This is his inner circle. These are his inner counselors. These are the men that he trusts. And you see that already in a matter of seconds, he's threatening them. But, verse 6, if you tell me the dream, You'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So the Chaldeans response number two in verse seven, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. Well, the king now speaks the third time. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. 
he goes from these being the inner circle of men that he trusts, you know, the insecurity and fear, he's now accusing them of launching a cabal. He's now accusing them of collaborating together to speak lies and corrupt words to the king. This is the inner circle, and already in a matter of seconds, he shifted to, you have launched a cabal against me, and there's only one thing that's going to happen for you. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you give it, give me its interpretation. Verses 10 and 11. The Chaldeans, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. There is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The Chaldeans are exactly right. No one can do what you're asking. You're asking something that falls outside the domain of human possibility. And you see these back and forth between Nebuchadnezzar and his inner circle. Um, but again, I would remind us all, there is a God in heaven who can, who does. No. Verse 12. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. So in verse 12, you see Nebuchadnezzar is so unsettled, so fearful, so, so in such a panic rage so furious that he gives the command to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. This is like almost unimaginable. Not just his inner circle, but everyone who would ever serve in this capacity, kill them all. If I can't get the answer I want right now, kill them all. And again, you see when lost people, people who don't know God, are put into the crux, put into the crucible, it's insecurity and hostility that come out. Verse 13, he's angry and he's very furious and he gives the command to kill them all. Men begin to die, no doubt. Um, Daniel and his friends are just not there. Now, before we move any further, I do want you to catch two words um, and that's counsel and wisdom. If we looked up in verse 14, it says that with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch. The words there um, in the Aramaic are really prudence and discernment. That gives you a better idea. So Daniel was not only a godly man, but Daniel was a prudent man. Daniel was a wise man. Daniel was a discerning man. And Daniel answers Arioch and says, hey, why is this so urgent? But he does so with prudence and discernment as he approaches the captain of the guard who's been given the command to kill him. So Daniel asks in verse 15, why is this decree so urgent? And Arioch answers and makes known the whole thing to Daniel. Now, never, ever miss this point. This captain of the guard who worked for Nebuchadnezzar, who was going to do what Nebuchadnezzar said, stops long enough to answer Daniel's questions. And this reminds us, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Daniel is being given favor with Arioch by the God on high. And the same is true for us. We can find ourselves in an impossible situation, but yet God can stall it, God can stop it, and that's what happens here. So Arioch explains to Daniel what's going on. Verse 16, then Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar. We don't know exactly what he said, but he went and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation in verse 16. Now imagine this, the king has just accused his inner circle. He's just accused all of them of you just buying time. But Daniel asked for more time to give the interpretation. And the king says, 
okay. Again, I would remind you, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he will. And there's no reason that Nebuchadnezzar should have given Daniel his request, except that we serve a sovereign God, and that's exactly what is happening here. Daniel goes in and says, we will give you the interpretation. And by the way, by implication, we'll tell you the dream also. And the king says, okay, I'll do it. Even though just a few verses, just eight verses back, he had accused the others of trying to buy time. Now, this is a Muriel that we believe was in um, the courthouse in the um, chamber room of Nebuchadnezzar. This is where Daniel found himself facing Nebuchadnezzar with this beautiful brick wall um, behind him there in the massive temple, or excuse me, the massive um, palace of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. So again, Daniel agreed to interpret a dream that he had no reason to believe he could interpret except that he served Yahweh. He now goes and tells Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, hey, good news, boys. They're killing the wise men because no one can interpret a dream, but don't worry, I got it, stop I got it all stopped. I told the king we could interpret it, verse 18. But he told them this, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. So in verse 17, he goes to his friends, tells them, what happened? We read, sort of read his mail in verse 18 because he's expecting they're going to have a prayer time with God. They're going to cry out to God who knows all things concerning this, this secret that they might not perish. And this prudent, discerning man is also a man of prayer. Verse 19. Then the secret is revealed to Daniel in a night vision. The implication is after this prayer meeting where they pray that they might not die, where they pray that God might reveal this secret, the dream and the interpretation, Daniel went to sleep. Now that's a man who trusts God. Now whether or not he went to sleep, we do not know. But I guarantee you this is a man who trusts God. And God reveals the secret to Daniel in a night vision. Then we read, and I, Daniel, bless the God of heaven. They prayed, God answered, and they praised. So it moves from a prayer meeting to a praise meeting to a time of absolute worship. So, you know, if this would have been me, I'm afraid I would have jumped up and ran right back to the king and said, God told me we got it. But he had time enough, not only to pray, we would all have time in this case, but to praise God when God delivered. A good lesson for us. Verse 22 he said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and might are his. He is sovereign. He raises up. He pulls down. He gives wisdom. He gives knowledge. He reveals secrets. There's no darkness to him. And in fact, there's nothing but light with them. And in verse 23, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. And we see that this what started out as great petitioning and crying out to God has broke out into a worship service. It reminds me of James 1, 2 through 4, where James writes, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, diverse trials, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, 
lacking nothing. Here's four young men in the crucible, in a trial. And you see what they did. They're men who indeed, it appears, counted it all joy. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. He's heard that before. Verse 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and who has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So verse 24, Daniel goes to Arioch. He says, don't kill the wise men. Bring me before the king. Verse 25, Arioch quickly brings Daniel before the king. And I love it. You can almost see Arioch as he goes into the king's presence. Uh, king, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Well, not really. Actually, Daniel had found the king in the first place. And then Daniel came and found you. But okay, whatever. Verse 26 the king is clear in his question. He has not compromised or moved on his position at all. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answers, and he reminds the king that what you're doing, what you're asking, no human being on earth can do. It cannot be done. But then we have that conjunction, but, verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Notice Daniel gives all credit to God. And not only is he going to give all credit to God, he's going to be sure that no credit goes to him. Verse 30, but as for me, this secret was not revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. He said, it wasn't revealed to me because of my righteousness. It wasn't revealed to me because I'm special. It wasn't revealed to me because I'm smart. But it was revealed. Now notice what the New King James says. It says, but for our and ours italicized, we could take it out, but for the sake who make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Let me give you the ESV, which really fits most other translations. He says this, but as for me, the mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. This has been revealed, king, that you may know exactly what you dreamed and what the exact interpretation is and that you might know that there's only one God, the true and living God, Yahweh, and all of these other gods that you serve here in Babylon, Nabu, Marduk, they're all fake gods and their servants cannot help you, but a servant of Yahweh can help you because Yahweh is the true and living God. And once again, we see God doing what God is doing all the time, and that is making himself known. Here God is behind enemy lines in his servants, making himself known to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 31, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was very awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, 
its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So now Daniel begins to unfold the dream and the interpretation, and really as you see even what the king was doing at the time. And so not only is God showing himself to be great, and he is, but he's right, reminding Nebuchadnezzar that he, Nebuchadnezzar, is small compared to the awesomeness of Yahweh. Yes, he is a great power, but he's a great power that's been exalted by God. Yes, he is a, oversees a mighty city, but it's rulership that's been ordained by God. So verse 31, here is what he saw the king, this great image whose splendor was excellent, and it stood before you, Nebuchadnezzar, and its form was awesome. The ESV and the RSV agree. They translate like this, you, O king, you saw, O king, and behold a great image, this image mighty and of exceeding brightness, I imagine it was made out of all these metals, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. You see, it's not that its appearance was just awesome, but his appearance was frightening, the idea of dread. And then he begins to describe it. The image of head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly clay. Verses 34 and 35, Daniel said, You saw a stone, and it was cut out without hands, and it struck the image on its feet and broke it into pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold are tr crushed together and they become like chaff on the threshing floor and the wind carries what, what once was this awesome, terrifying statue that represented kingdoms as we will see. The wind just carries it away and there's no trace found. As you read this, it reminded me of Psalm 1, verse 4, when it talks about the ungodly. It says, the ungodly are not so, they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. So this stone strikes the image, but then it becomes a great mountain, and this great mountain fills the entire earth. Verse 36, this is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with the clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. There is Nebuchadnezzar's great terrifying image, the head of gold, the arms, the chest of silver, the hands even of silver, 
the midsection of bronze and the legs of iron with feet that are partly iron and partly ceramic clay. Verse 37 is crystal clear. Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. In fact, the rest of these are kingdoms, and surely this does represent the kingdom of Babylon. But in fact, more precisely, it represents Nebuchadnezzar. And look how he describes the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Stop for a moment. Who did? The God of heaven. This is a pagan king, yet we serve a God who does as he pleases in the armies of, of, of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. He is the one who raises up and he is the one who puts down. And the God of heaven, Yahweh, is the one who gave Nebuchadnezzar this power. The God of heaven, Yahweh, is the one who allowed him to take the temple and destroy it, who allowed him to march so many Judeans off in these three waves of captivity. Verse 38, and wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and he has made you ruler over them all. This means Nebuchadnezzar, and here's Daniel's point and it's Yahweh's point. The power you have has been given to you by Yahweh. You are the head of gold. Verse 39, part A. But after you shall arise another kingdom that is inferior to yours. Just as silver is not, is not as valuable as gold, this coming kingdom will not, will be inferior to yours. Just as silver is a little bit more brittle than gold, this coming kingdom will be inferior to your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. Theologians absolutely agree that the kingdom represented here by the arms, the hands, the chest of silver is the Medo-Persian Empire. In fact, we're actually going to see the kingdom change hands to the Medo-Persian Empire um, here in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. So Nebuchadnezzar's the king, the head of gold, representing the entire Babylonian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire is the chest, the arms of silver. They will begin to reign, the Medo-Persian Empire, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, in 539 B.C., and that reign will continue until 331 B.C. Picking up with verse 39 again, the belly of thighs and of bronze are a third kingdom, this kingdom of bronze which shall rule over the whole earth. So this represents a kingdom that just as bronze is inferior to silver, this kingdom will be inferior to the Medo-Persian Empire. Just as bronze is more brittle than silver, this kingdom will be inferior to the first two kingdoms. Theologians and historians agree. The consensus is this is the Greek empire under Alexander the Great that reigned from 331 BC to 63 BC. This is the belly and the thighs of bronze. This is the Grecian empire. Verses 40 and 41 tell us of a fourth and final kingdom. This fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, this kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. This is the legs of iron. This is the feet that are partly iron and that are partly clay. This is the feet that um, where the strength of iron and the fragileness and fragility of ceramic clay are mingled together and this kingdom cannot stand. This kingdom will be very powerful and very destructive, yet it is inferior to the first three. If we saw what was going on, if we look in the New Testament and look back at what was going on um, in Jesus's life, we see this kingdom. Theologians agree this is the Roman Empire. They are the legs of iron, the feet of iron, and and part uh, ceramic clay. This kingdom reigned from 663 BC to 476 AD. That's a typo right there. That should be AD. I'll have to fix that. Um, here, Daniel is given, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is given kingdoms, four powerful kingdoms that will reign one after the other, yet each one 
is inferior to the one that was before it. These are the four kingdoms of his vision. These are um, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, and the Roman Empire. Notice verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Notice the language carefully. For it tells of the kingdom of God existing now, but finding its greatest fulfillment in the time of this empire, this Roman empire, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and ceramic clay. And then in verse 44, we are introduced to the stone. And in those days, these, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. And it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Notice just five things with me, if you will. First, what he's about to talk about with the stone is going to happen in the days of these kings. And it's the God of heaven who is going to do it. And in the process of doing it, he is going to set up a kingdom. And that is exactly what we see with Jesus Christ. He is the stone that the builders rejected. He is the one that destroyed all world powers before him. And he is the one, God through him, has set up a kingdom. Let's see what else it says. This kingdom shall never be destroyed. Unlike all of the kingdoms that have gone on before him, this kingdom would be eternal. This kingdom would last. If you're a Christian today, you're a member of that kingdom. A kingdom, according to Hebrews 12, that cannot be shaken. Notice number next, this kingdom shall not be left to other people. All these earthly kingdoms were passed from one king to another. This kingdom would have one king, and that king would reign eternally. Fourthly, notice that this kingdom would break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Again, Hebrews makes it 12, 12, uh, 28 makes it clear. You and I are, have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And then finally, point number five, this kingdom shall stand forever. Verse 45 goes on to say, as much as you saw the stone was cut out from the mountain without hands and it, that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is true. This is an amazing prophecy about the coming Messiah's kingdom, not during the millennial reign, right now. It started in the days of the Roman Empire and it continues right now. And that mountain is covering this earth. His kingdom is sweeping this planet and it shall stand forever. Now, if I may, only in passing, this verse does not teach anything about another coming world kingdom, a fifth kingdom, or a Roman empire that's reconstituted or rebuilt or reestablished, um, implying that the ten toes or somehow another kingdom is as away from the context of the verses as implying the ten fingers are another kingdom or the Two ears are another kingdom. If you are exegeting this text, if you are reading the text and letting it speak, it tells you of four kingdoms. It numbers them. It explains their weakness. It explains their power. And I would remind you, as we read in 244, it will be in the days of these kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that's exactly what he was doing. It was beginning here to be established behind enemy lines in Babylon. It would find its ultimate completion on earth, if you will, with the Messiah dying. And then the kingdom would begin to expand around the globe. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. Verse 5. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering of incense to him. 
The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the kings, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Verse 47, or excuse me, 46, you see that Nebuchadnezzar, the king who was executing wise men just a moment ago, falls down before Daniel. He commands an offering, an incense be made to him. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. He's the revealer of secrets since he is the one who revealed this great secret. This is the greatest truth from the lips of a pagan king that actually testifies of the greatness of Yahweh God. Now here in verse 47, it would seem that Nebuchadnezzar has made a confession in Yahweh God. He's hooked his wagon to God. He, it's, he's a true believer. I would just say, stay tuned. Verse 48, the king promoted Daniel. He gave him gifts. He made him the ruler over the whole providence of Babylon. He made him chief administrator. Daniel was in charge of all the wine, wise men. And then Daniel asked the king, hey, how about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And he sets them over the affairs of Babylon. But verse 49, Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Just something real quick um, before we wrap it up. Daniel was a man who could serve his God and yet serve a pagan king as if he was serving his God. And he was never conflicted unless it, it was a call for him to disobey his God. He served that pagan king with all he had, yet never compromised and did not turn his back on his relationship with God. And that's a good lesson for us. We all work in a pagan world, or at least most of us do. But we should be serving our boss like we're serving God. And only when he's trying to get us to disobey the commands of our Lord should we go against him. So I like to end with the question, where is Jesus in the text? Well, obviously, as you see Daniel stand before Nebuchadnezzar, as you see his boldness, as you see his humility, as you see everything that's happened, you can't help but see Jesus in front of Herod and Jesus in front of Pilate. But let's be honest, it's more than that, right? Jesus is the stone. Jesus is the one who crushes all other kingdoms. Jesus is the one who dying on the cross initiated a kingdom, a kingdom that grew into a mountain and then covered this planet. The stone has launched a kingdom that cannot be stopped, an eternal kingdom. Now, equally, we understand this rock stone imagery is all over the scriptures. I'll give you just a few. Matthew 16, 18, as, as Jesus is interacting with Peter and he says, upon this rock, that's Peter's confession that he had just made, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You see, Jesus is the rock and the testimony of who he is, is a rock. Uh, Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Jesus is that stone. Psalm 118, 22, The stone which the builders rejected, which the Jews did, has become the chief cornerstone, which indeed it surely did. Now, I hear a great deal about a coming world power and about the Antichrist and about his power and about destruction and about his kingdom. But I would remind you, if you're a believer today, you are a remember, you are a member of the stone's kingdom, Jesus Christ's kingdom, a kingdom that has swept this planet, a kingdom that has not passed from one to another, a kingdom that shall never end. And if we use the imagery of Daniel, a kingdom that crushes all other kingdoms. I'll leave you with the words of Jesus. I'm going to build my church. Jesus says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, we could frame it up like this. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, the gospel is going to advance 
around the globe to build my church and hell and all of hell's minion cannot stop it. I submit unto you, Daniel chapter 2.